So we think about change at scale. How does the way we understand the universe change the way we think about scale, the way we act, and even who we are as human beings? We have three great people to address this topic. Fabio Gondor visiting us all the way from Brazil. Thank you to Carlos Arruda from FDC, our partner school down in Brazil. And Carlos is also a member of the board of Ken. We appreciate his visit quite a bit. Introduced me to Fabio and said, he's the guy you need to talk about changes in research and science and how they're being commercialized and transitioned. And David Krakauer, you might remember from last year, runs an organization at University of Wisconsin called the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery. Talk about a big park to play in. Well, he's a big enough guy to play in that park, and uh, you'll hear that in a moment. And of course, my colleague and friend, Ben Jones, who's been doing a lot of research, not just about his general field of strategy, but a lot of research around how do we create and disseminate knowledge. Ben, over to you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, it's a real pleasure to join in this conversation with Fabio and David. I've been looking forward to this, this trialogue uh, under the topic of science as and in uh, transformation. Uh, to frame our conversation, I wanted to start with a, with a metaphor, which is really a comment or a quote from one of the great scientists uh, of the modern era, Isaac Newton. Uh, it's a quote you may have heard. He was at the end of his life looking back, and he said, I was like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself now and then, finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, while the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. That, that quote is uh, of unusual modesty, actually, for Newton. He wasn't thought to be a man known for his humility. Uh, but I like that quote, and I, and I like it for our session, because what I want to do with Fabio and David is talk about the ocean that's still ahead. And there's still a vast ocean ahead. What's the 21st century ocean look like? But I also want to talk about the shore, because Newton, as a boy wandering kind of alone, looking, looking at seashells, is a, is a very appropriate model for, for his time, but it is very different today in how we do science, and I want to explore that as well. Several introductory dimensions, scale, a theme of our conference. Newton alone, today, we look at 1.4 million peer-reviewed science articles produced every year, sort of like new boxes of seashells are being dumped into mountains on this shore. How do, how do scientists, how do corporate lab researchers even digest that new information, understand it all. Related, teams, Newton alone. But today, science is very much, very often a team sport. I've done a lot of research suggesting that teamwork is increasingly the locus of the highest impact work. We've seen examples of that uh, over the last few days, starting with a keynote on, on innovation and space uh, exploration and the giant teams that are involved there, not to mention the Human Genome Project or CERN or many other contexts. Organizations. Newton was kind of doing his own thing. You know, Copernicus was finding time to look up at the stars in between other activities. But today we have organizations that do science. We have giant structures on that shore, corporate labs. We have research universities. We have lots of public and nonprofit uh, research institutes. And we also have a much longer shoreline. That shoreline now goes across the whole world. We have a global geography of science, particularly Fabio coming here uh, doing leading research uh, with his team for IBM uh, from Brazil. So to start, I want to start on the shore, if you will, and talk about science today, and then maybe a bit later we can talk a little bit about the ocean that's still ahead of us. And starting with the shore, let's think about best practices in the context of how science is done today and how we search for the next big scientific breakthroughs. For example, what makes a good team? Uh, do I go open source? Do I stay internal? Do I give my researchers and my team creative freedom, or do I try to strongly direct what they do? Uh, where do I locate in the world? Any number of these dimensions. Uh, why don't we start, uh, Fabio, with you, and then we'll, we'll move, move over to David. What, what are your thoughts on sort of best practices on this new scientific uh, landscape? OK. So first of all, thank you very much for giving me the chance to be here. I have this nasty foreign accent. Yeah, being Brazilian. OK. And um, it has been pretty fun and thoughtful the last two days I spent here at Kim. Kim. Um, I've seen very good storytellers, OK? And let me tell you that one of the best US storytellers passed away a few days ago. I'm talking about Maya Angelou. Why I have this bunch of atoms in my hands? 
Okay, atoms of ink on top of a piece of a tree. Because the technology has replaced atoms by bits. And once in a while, we have to get back to recover the best practice. It was really interesting uh, as a scientist. Scientists are strange animals. They take note of, of everything. Look at this. Okay? And they are fanatic for measurements. They are measuring everything. Every science was born on top of a measurement. And I noticed that whenever we had a representation in atoms, it was very successful, the story told by that particular storyteller. Just to illustrate my point, the dog satellite called a lot of attention because it was something tangible. Well, with this background, I would say science can provide a great methodology to solve problems in business the scientific methodology. And one of the best practices we have had is exactly the research lab we recently opened in Brazil, in which we decided to make something very innovative, create a model of science as a business. It's slightly opposed to the model of science practiced in a university. In a university, we have science as a doctrine. Nothing against. However, the science as a doctrine is not what we need to solve the complexity, growing complexity in a business environment. Well, I would say, Ben, to finish the answer to this question, that our model of science as a business, as it has been practiced in our lab, although the lab is pretty young, four years old, has been a very good example of you adequate use of science to solve the problems in a world of growing complexity. I want to follow up on that, but let me, let me turn to David first. I mean, you have an existence in, in different locations geographically with the Santa Fe Institute, also at the University of Wisconsin. What are best practices to you in trying to drive the exciting scientific breakthroughs uh, that you have devoted your life to? So hello, kin people. It's, uh, just, uh, it's been fun coming back. I, um, and nice to see Esther. I haven't seen Esther for about 200 years. Uh, so um, let's see. So let me just, since I'm in front of this, I want to just give you a metaphor. Uh, often people talk, I mean, so let's make one point clear. The problem of, of, of um, someone in a position of leadership is a problem of scale. There is no problem at small scale. And so it is, only, as far as I'm concerned. We know how to educate when it's small. We know how to do research in small groups. We don't really know how to scale them up, and we're terrible at it. And so I'm curious to see how you try and solve that. Um, but, but there isn't a single best practice. So here's, what I, here's my metaphor, and it fits in with this picture. So I, I call this sort of the life cycle of an idea, mountains, monasteries, and the metropolis. And so, and I'm going to do it with narrative, since you mentioned Maya Angelou. And so um, there's a phase in thinking where you need this exquisite, pristine solitude. Um, you need time free of other minds, right? This is the world of Ed Abbey's Desert Solitaire or Thoreau's Walden, okay? That's the mountain. Uh, you then need a group of individuals who are like-minded, zealots, uh, competitive uh, and focused, and that's the monastery, okay? And this is the world, the murderous world of Umberto Eco's Name of the Rose, right? Um, or C.P. Snow's The Masters. And then at some point you need to diffuse into the metropolis. Okay? And that's the world of Victor Hugo and Dickens' scale. And I think we need to understand that um, what makes you great in the mountains, makes you a great Edward Abbey, is not what makes you great in a city. Right? And uh, all these institutions we build are trying to construct sweet spots. So just to apply the metaphor to, to institutes, I would say that the Media Lab, Right? Uh, my own institute, a, more, a younger version, is a monastery in a metropolis. That's what we're trying to create. The Santa Fe Institute is a monastery in the mountains. Okay? And IBM and Bell Labs are trying to do something that might be imp impossible. That is their monasteries and their metropolis. And I'm not sure that that optimi optimization can be pulled off. So Bell Labs the way it really worked is it was a metropolis, but essentially it felt like a monastery. 
because it was highly modular in its structure. So I think we need to be sophisticated and realize that there are very different structures required at different stages in the development of ideas. Very interesting. So uh, as a matter of introspection, I often find that I get my best ideas when I'm driving. Right. And for a long time, the, the radio in my car didn't work because the battery would ran out and had some code. I didn't know what the code was to restart it. <laughs> so it was always enforced silence. I uh, couldn't be distracted by anything, and I, and I was definitely in the mountains there, uh, and that definitely is a place for me that was, was great for creativity, but then I, then I got the radio fixed, and I don't get good <laughs> ideas anymore. Um, but if, if, the, if, if, the, if the mountain might sound a bit like what happens in a lot of research universities, or at least in the beginning, people are sort of coming up with ideas. Now, Fabia, you're working in, a, working in a setting where you're doing deep research, and yet you're also looking towards commercial possibility. And you're trying to engage some of, maybe that, some of that mountain going on in other universities, other research institutes around the world. You know, what do you think in terms of best practices or more in your own, in your own context? How does, how does a corporate lab best draw on the insights that are coming out from that mountain and draw it into your own thinking and make use of it? Um, I'm going to try to answer this question in the perspective of our own company and also in the perspective of my own experience. Uh, let me clarify something here. I, I just forgot. My background was in medicine, but I didn't kill anybody. Relax. <laughs> okay, because whenever we say, well, this guy was a doctor and all of a sudden switched to computers, somebody may yeah, yeah. think, hmm, something wrong may have happened. <laughs> Good to clarify. No, the point is I went through a totally different uh, medicine school, you see, uh, I devoted a substantial part of my life to the field of mathematics. When I got out of the medicine school, I went to specialize myself in pediatric surgery. Pediatric surgery is the field of medicine where you learn how to cut children. Okay, but then you put all together. White and white, yellow ye and yellow and uh, red and red, okay, and it's all done, okay? So anyway, by dealing with congenital malformations, I made a small discovery in the field of mathematics and to explore this discovery approach at computers. Long story short, the virus of computers attacked me. I had a computational septicemia and I died. <laughs> okay, then I switched to computers applied to healthcare and then to research. Now, uh, back to your question, Ben. We, we have been doing some interesting experiments, okay? Modeling business entities by using pretty sophisticated mathematical tools, all right? Which has been a topic of a lot of conversations I've had in the last two days. Uh, for instance, I talked with that uh, superb uh, graphic artist, the lady who designed the challenge medal, and I told her, do you know that the format you have used correspond to a geometric figure called Lemon Escape of Bernoulli? And she said, what? Okay, so if we can put science to support the foundation of some decisions, this decision-making process will be more robust. All right, and to do so, we can count on some uh, sophisticated mathematical tools and modeling. Now, putting that in simpler words, okay, there are three names in the IT arena which are very fashionable at this moment. Cloud computing, big data, and analytics. By themselves, they will not do much. However, if we, if we can connect the three of them by using the adequate research results and extract some sort of knowledge in a different format, okay, the science will finally pay back all the investment that has been made in research. Very interesting. David, come to the other side of this now, because you, you sit in a research university like I do. And I think you were hinting at this before with your model of the monastery meeting the metropolis. But how do you stay relevant? So, so in, a, in, a science, in a science research institute context, a nonprofit, a public university, the, the contract with the worker is do what you would like. Uh, just to come up with you know, interesting ideas, and maybe they'll spill over, may, maybe they won't. Now, of course, most 
most academic researchers, anyone working, say, in intramural labs within the NIH, wants to be very relevant. They would love to have their curiosity take them in places that could change the world. But how do you do that? How do you, how do you stay relevant in the research university context? Well, I mean, well, I know how to stay relevant in the research university context, and I'm not, I don't think it's the same as staying relevant in the market. That's what I mean. Okay. And so, and, and I think the golden age of research labs doing fundamental research is over. I mean, we should, I mean, the, the, the monopoly power that allowed Xerox to own everything in an office or Bell Labs in communication is gone. So I don't think that's going to happen. Um, one thing that frustrates me ever so slightly is this idea that companies can be looking into universities for the next great thing with the presumption that they'll recognize them when they see them. Really great things are not only invisible, but offensive when visible. Okay? And so um, quantum mechanics was offensive when visible. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, general relativity was offensive when visible. Um, the theory of evolution is still offensive in this country. Okay? And so really great ideas um, take time to mature. right? And of course, I mean, quantum mechanics is a beautiful example the semiconductor, the atomic clock, the laser, general relativity with GPS. So they have huge utility. But I sometimes feel that our desire to make the university, the research university, relevant presumes that there is an instant awareness of the economic value of an idea when there isn't even an awareness of the value by your peers. So I think we, we need more sophistication. There are ideas, and we can get there, but, but I, I would, I'd like people to understand that. When you talk about innovation and disruptive, you're saying, it, it's going to irritate me. It's going to worry me. Not that I'll instantly see its value for my business. And I think that's important. I think that is important. Mm -hmm. Actually, one of my great examples of serendipity uh, in this regard, it was raised, uh, Rob raised before, combinations. The creativity is combina combinations, mm -hmm. which goes back to Schumpeter and many others who study creativity from many different disciplines. You know, at some level, what we're trying to do is put forward the material for those com combinations, and it's very hard to foresee where they, where they may lead. One of the great ones is uh, these scholars at Indiana University, who several decades ago, decades ago were out in uh, Yellowstone, one of the national parks here, tromping around in their rubber boots in the geysers. And they found bacteria that could survive at very, very, very high heat. A curiosity. They were called extremophiles. No particular application. Fast forward, you've got uh, Mullis uh, coming up with the polymerase chain reaction, which is the essential technology of genomics, which duplicates DNA and allows us to do everything from forensics to sequencing genomes. It turns out that in order to do that, he needed to use an extremophile bacteria. And he was able to put that combination together. Very serendipitous, but but it's Can but I just, essential. Uh, let me make a technical remark from my own field in relation again to this. Schumpeter makes a clear distinction between the invention and the adoption, the fixation, the innovation, right? And I think, so I'm going to give you two fields I work in. So in population genetics, in mathematical population genetics, um, the rate of adoption of a beneficial mutation is proportional to the population size. So it gets better with scale, okay? So that, think of that as production and efficiency. But the the generation of inventions is inversely proportional to population size. And this comes from developmental genetics, which says that the more components there are, the more constraining factors there are in the system. And so even though you produce more, you produce more of the same. And so I, we even have a mathematical framework that tells us that um, if you want creativity, cut back and look at Xerox, look at Rockefeller, look at SFI, look at Media Lab. We know, there's no secret, you've got to be small to be creative, but you need scale for productivity. So, it, it, and I don't think you can do both, and I think it would be naive to presume it, and that's why most companies spin off, you know, their, their crazy little companies to, to try and get those small scale effects. How do you, how do, you do it? I want to know, I want to know, how do you do it? I would it? like to share with you and the audience yeah. a measurement yeah. In sync with what I just said, mm -hmm. scientists are always uh, leaning towards measurement. I suspect I had a slide to here. Can you please project my first slide? Oh, there he is. <laughs> it was fast. <laughs> Forget the Portuguese words, okay. This line here is the number of atoms in the planet. Do you know we can estimate the number of atoms in the planet? 
it equals to 10 to the power of 50, pretty big number. And this number is almost constant. It has small variations, okay? For instance, when an asteroid hits the planet, the number of atoms grows a little bit. When we do a nuclear experiment, transforming mass into energy, the number of atoms lowers a little bit. But in general, we can consider this number a constant, okay? Here I have a timeline beginning in 1750 and going up 20, 21, 22nd century, okay? What we have here is the population of our planet which began to be measured in uh, 18th century, okay? And has been constantly growing. In such a measurement, when we have a break like here, this break was caused by a, an adjustment in the methodology, okay? But the, the behavior of the population growth is almost steady, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do a pretty sophisticated calculation, guys. I'm gonna divide this constant number by this curve. What's gonna happen? Next one. Oh, God. This curve shows the number of atoms that you, Kevin, are entitled to. <laughs> okay, this is the number of atoms per person. <laughs> there, keep moving, keep moving. Yeah, there it is. So, you get back home and say, darling, there will be not sufficient atoms to all of us. Smaller dinner tonight. Yes, a smaller <laughs> dinner. By the way, these atoms can be packed together in different ways. Can be your Ferrari, okay? But can be also the shoes of an inhabitant in Brazil down there. So this gives us a different perspective of production, of material, all right? So whenever we talk about doing something, and that's the reason I I've approached Anne and I said there are two added value chains which creates a lot of waste, food and civil construction. If we can reduce the waste in those two areas, we will give a great contribution to the use of materials, as you raise it, David, by saving atoms. Nice measurement. Oh, there is a third axle here. There is another axle, uh, which will be the object of a research we are doing which relates with the raising consumption per human being as time goes on. I remember uh, when I was a child, okay? And this is not a complaint. This is a narrative of the reality. I had two shoes and it was far than enough. How many shoes do you have? Tell me. <laughs> you don't want to. <laughs> more than I need. Yeah, more than you need, of course. <laughs> and women are particularly good in having more shoes than they need. Yeah, yeah, but not as many as you want. <laughs> Thank you for your candor. <laughs> uh, shut it down. Later on, we can return. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Fabio. I'm going to go home and start hoarding atoms. <laughs> <laughs> and I recommend you all do, too. No, this is a plain vanilla calculation, but you have to do it to understand what is behind this thing called sustainability. It's not a question of being nice, politically correct. It's a question of using the adequate and fair share of atoms that belongs to you. So let, <laughs> let, let's take that. Are you starting to look into the future? And I want to, I if you will, using my initial metaphor where we've been talking about the life on the shore today, uh -huh. uh, now look at toward the horizon a little bit. Uh, and see what we think is coming. We've got a, a person at the, le the leading edge of computer science at IBM. From a corporate perspective, we've got yeah, someone who's a leader. This is a very compelling question. What's going to happen with the computer from now on? Okay. I would say if I can summarize in a single sentence, forget the computer and think of computation. You will not even see where's the computer. First of all, because the computer may take strange shapes, like this thing here. This may well be a future computer. I don't know. That's an orgasmatron. That's <laughs> <laughs> Good, David. <laughs>
Now we're going to think, we, we have to think about computation and in, in our strategic vision, the IBM strategic vision points towards what we've been called, uh, what we've been calling cognitive computing. Uh, in summary, first wave, computers implementing algorithms to solve problems. Second wave, Computing, managing programs, okay, in a, at a scale, okay. By the way, did you realize, guys, that the name of program changed? What's the name of program today? App. If you ask a, a guy, what do you do? I'm a programmer. This is not charming. But if you ask a person, what do you do? And the person says, I am a iOS app developer. Oh, my goodness. What a charming profession, okay? <laughs> so the next wave will be the one devoted to transform data and algorithms into knowledge. This is the cognitive computing. Uh, the word will be kind of weird and strange with cognitive computing, okay? Because it will be pretty difficult to identify um, what is written in the... Um, Northwestern University Crest. Quecunque sunt vera. What's the truth? Okay, this is written in the crest of the Northwestern University, okay? And with cognitive computing, what's the truth? It's the truth said by somebody or said to, by a machine or by a bunch of different machi machines, okay? Fortunately, when this era comes up, very likely, I will be not in the surface of this planet anymore. It's up to you. Goodbye. Let me, uh, let me jump in and come to, come to you, David. So you're in both computation and genetics. You're looking forward a decade, two decades. What are the things that the emerging fields of research or the kinds of breakthroughs you see on the horizon that you think might really change how we live or change business practice? Yeah. Um, so let me just respond a little. I'm not, as you know, I'm not a... Esther was sort of making these remarks about human properties, integrity, ethics. So here's what I'm going to say. I actually think there's a lot of discussion, many of you will know, about the humanities. I think we're going to have a huge renaissance in the humanities because we're going to get over our tech obsession because it will be naturalized. And uh, the social humanistic element will become dominant. And so actually, if you... So I hate to say this uh, in, a, in, a, in a tech setting, but I actually feel the humanistic values will become more and more important as we are actually assaulted by machines. And so let me just... Yeah, give us give it a concrete example. So let me give a concrete example. Mean. So here's, a, here's, here's what I mean. So in my own field, uh, in research science, um, there have always been two cardinal virtues, prediction and explanation. Mm -hmm. And prediction was the test of the truthfulness of your explanation, the accuracy of your explanation. And under computing, they've bifurcated. And with machine learning, uh, prediction, we now have a world where prediction is possible without explanation. And so one future, I think, is the, the sort of individuals forfeiting the desire to understand the world in favor of a desire to control it. And with complex systems, uh, like the body and like society, which remain irreducibly complex, that is, they're very high dimensional. You can't write down e equals mc squared, f, e f equals ma. Um, systems that allow understanding and control. Uh, I think uh, we're going to move, utility will dominate, and we'll move towards pure control. So that's one big concern I have about the world of computing. In terms of areas that I think are really exciting, just to sort of uh, be futuristic, um, I think evolutionary engineering is now reaching a point of maturity. Um, I think that intelligent materials um, is fascinating. We have a whole group that works on them. Um, I think what you're describing, a genuine un understa scientific understanding of society um, is dawning on us uh, with implications for control, which are frightening. Um, mm -hmm. So I always think every generation has its dominant cultural field and, con and correlated externalities, largely negative. 
So in the golden age of thermodynamics, the 18th and 19th century, coal production produced smog. We live in the information age that produces, you know, um, spam and spies. And so I think there are huge externalities for technology, and I think that's where the humanistic dimension will, will dominate. That's exactly what I try yes. to bring up. You see the humanistic aspect. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Well, there's an old, an old distinction between mm -hmm. science and technology is technology is about how, and science is about why. Uh, and you're right that we have a lot of how now that we may not understand. And it's interesting to raise the, the ethical components and the humanistic components. You see, Ben, sorry to interrupt you. In the just floor, to, please. Yeah, no, no, just to, yeah. to, to illustrate what uh, David has uh, very properly called externality, mm -hmm. we've been talking about that before. There is a technological wave which influenced a lot the way we create and transmit content in the, in the planet, but notably in the US. One is Twitter. And the other one is this format called TED. Everybody wants to be a TED artist. No longer, man. TED is out. It's, it's, it's now, yeah, I think it's for God's sake, thank you. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting, yeah. Yeah, because, you yeah. know, uh, yeah. TED is not enough, you yeah. see, to cover all the needs of generating, mm. transmitting, and discussing content. You also, just to connect a couple of these comments, yeah. uh, David, you earlier mentioned that without these monopolies like Bell Labs, yeah. and you could have AT&T, where it made sense to do a lot of basic research in a corporate setting because you were likely to capture whatever the benefits of that were. That's much harder for a, a corporation to sustain in a world where there's lots of competition. You come up with some basic insight with your investment dollars, your shareholder dollars, and some competitor now goes and runs with it. That may suggest that the university or these public research institutes are increasingly important for those basic research insights, in addition to the, the human, humanistic questions but that you're raising I, as I well. But also, I want to say, I mean, one thing I, I mean, I didn't want to, so, I, so one thing that I've been building and I, is building, trying to build companies in university settings. So there are fields, I mean, I should, I'll be nepotistic, I'll mention it, my brother. So my brother runs a group at Johns Hopkins called the Blam Lab, very cool, it's the brain learning, animation, and motion lab. And they started something called the CATA project, K-A-T-A. And the idea is essentially to bring a video game company into the center of Hopkins Medical School, uh, where they develop apps <laughs> um, for uh, essentially entertainment and measuring motor performance. And that's a beautiful example where um, having those two groups together in that somewhat free environment, allows the neuroscientists to acquire extraordinary data from these mobile platforms. And it lines, allows game developers to learn about cognitive dispositions for game development. So there are clear areas. I actually think that um, I like the model, in fact, of um, intermingling. We've not touched this, but I believe that humans are social, deeply social. We will never have truly virtual distributed relationships. Um, I, I mean, we can discuss it. I, I think that the, the community that I encounter that's most dependent on social interactions is the community in Silicon Valley. Good, right? Good point. Uh, right? And Very so, good point. And I think that the, so building places where these worlds can collide regularly, as opposed to me saying, I now have a product, it's packaged in order for you to use it and, and, and generated at scale, it's, it's absolutely the wrong model for the interaction between commerce and the university. I'm much more interested in a, in a hybrid experiment. Mm -hmm. but I don't know if you... Well, I think we've run out of time. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to have to bring it to a close and reintroduce uh, Rob. But I, well, let me just uh, please join me in thanking both uh, Fabio and David for sharing these insights and wisdom. Ben, be, be, before, before you close, I got some atoms here and uh, added other atoms, okay, and transformed the challenge coin into my own condecoration. <laughs> now, I would like to invite you, please, to condecorate the first official of the Kin Order, the official Ron, okay, Rob Walcott. Can you please hold in his neck? <laughs> yes. Come on, you don't need to uh, stay uh, on your knees, okay? Should, should, yeah. we, should we call the Swedish royal family and maybe? <laughs> yeah. Oh, maybe, yeah. yeah. Next time. There's a big cash right. prize with that one, too. Great. Ah! Obrigado, ah. obrigado. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you, guys. That, that was great. Uh, let me.
make a couple of observations. Again, we got sucked into the humanities. What an extraordinary metaphorical group. Now, they were chosen with some intentionality. I know that all three of these gentlemen are great at speaking in metaphors. And when you're going from one complex space into another, you need to confer that information and knowledge through metaphors. So David, you started with a meaningful metaphor of mountains, monasteries, and metropoli. That was quite something interesting to think about. Great things are offensive when visible. Creativity, cut back. If you want to be creative, cut back. Fabio, you illustrate the journey of creativity, the journey of curiosity, going from medicine to I have a problem to solve, mathematics, combining this to computing to solve that problem, and then transitioning into a new horizon in your career, healthcare, and computing at IBM. And Ben, good lesson. Even if your battery doesn't die, turn off the radio from time to time. And this is a poignant piece of advice because we are connected all the time. This is embarrassing to say as a guy who is in love with technology and innovation, but in a way I've become proud of it. So here, this is my coming out party. I cannot access my email on my mobile phone. Not that I can't physically do that. I do, okay, I do know how to do it. <laughs> but I have intentionally, as my wife knows, never connected email on my smartphone. And you know what? I never will. Now, if there's ever an emergency, I can go on and use webmail and clunk around and get it. So, you know, but you know what? In the past eight years, nine years, ten years of having a smartphone, I've only needed to do that four times. It, it feels really good.